All right, here it is. It is uh, it's episode 154 with the great Ryan Divish of the uh, Seattle Times. And again, he's in that beautiful backdrop there in Ording, Washington. His weekly appearance is brought to you by Chalet Bowl, Washington's oldest bowling alley established in 1941, located in beautiful Tacoma's Proctor District, family owned and operated for 40 years. Their staff, the Frederick staff and family, specializes in customer service for your bowling. Your uh, food and fun experience while at their unique 12-lane facility. Go to ChaletBowl.com. Make your next reservation. Get some golf or get some bowling in, some fa- some deep-fried food and some beer uh, there at uh, Chalet Bowl. Hello, Ryan Divish with that Tacoma Rainiers hat there in beautiful Ording, Washington. How are you on this uh, beautiful Wednesday morning? I wish it was a little warmer. I don't know. It got cool last night at the game, too, man. It was chilly. I don't know what's going on. I, I got uh, got the Rainier's hat, but I also got, in honor of Vision Quest, my Loudon Swain Thompson wrestling T-shirt from the movie Vision Quest. I was gonna. Is wear that your shirt- favorite movie, by the way? One of the top five. I was gonna wear a shirt. I have one of the Rad from the movie Rad. I have a shirt from Rad Racing. You've never seen the movie Rad, where he's the, the BMX I, kid, and yeah. they have. The, it's got Lori Laughlin in it, Bart Connor. The former Olympic gymnast is the bad guy in it. It's really good. <laughs> okay, I, I, yes, I vague. I think I vaguely, vaguely remember it. Yeah, vaguely, it's a good though. movie. You should, you should go back and watch it. It's a, it's a good movie. Uh, you know, it teaches a lot about responsibility and not flipping <laughs> off other players. And oh, I, you know. I see what you're doing. I don't yeah. like it. You don't. We don't need to bring <laughs> the vampire back in. I mean, like, into, well, into I was talking people with, off. I was talking with a couple of my buddies that coach baseball back in Montana. And we were, I was telling them how my girlfriend's son Tyson had never really seen major league. He'd never seen bull Durham, never seen for love of the game. I'm like, you call yourself a baseball player. Yeah. He never seen the natural. I, mean, oh, come like, on. I know the natural is kind of slow, but like you got to see it for the end. And you know, spoiler alert in the book, he strikes out. He doesn't hit the home run that hits. the. Light. Okay. Spoiler alert. And this is, I mean, I didn't know it was a book. <laughs> Bernard Malamud. Am I, am I supposed to know that it was a yeah, book? I know. It's I, <laughs> terrible. I was almost a literature major going into college. So, is the book better? So, wait a minute. In the book, wait a minute. In the book, he strikes, he strikes out. And takes out? The money. Yeah. He oh takes the money. well. Well, that's a better ending. That's because that's more, it's more rea- realistic. That's you know? more realistic. Of course, he would have than done hitting that. a ball out of the stadium. He hits the lights and starts this parade of fireworks and stuff. Yeah, let's yeah take the money, man. What? The, come on, Roy. It is a little slow, though. Yeah, it's very slow. There's yeah. parts that are pretty cool, but it's very slow. Yeah. What's the bet? What's your mo- what's your favorite baseball movie? I mean, Bull Durham, obviously, and I, I do without think a that- doubt. Yeah, I do. I mean, Major League is really good, too. Um, But, like, Bull Durham. I I do think there's a little bit of Cal Raleigh, a little Crash Davis and Cal Raleigh. You know, switching catcher, you know, Henri tells people what he thinks. You know, like, Matt Brash was going nuke Lelouch in a game, and Cal went out there and let him have it. Did you see the video that Dan? Not as good. Not as good looking, though. Well, I mean, you know, Kevin Costner, it's a handsome man. Um, did you see the video that Daniel Kramer posted of Cal getting ejected in that Rainiers game? And it was a couple years ago. And I, it's funny, Tony Arnerich was coaching or managing that game. And, uh, he's trying to hold Cal back. And it looks like, like a, one of those, like the old rodeo movies where they strap a monkey on the back of a sheep and he's just dangling <laughs> around. Tony Arnerich is just like trying to hold the bull back with Cal. Are you, know, you surpri- how surprised, night. how surprised were you that he did not get run? I didn't think he got run. I was surprised, but you know, a lot of times when the umps know that they missed the call, they don't run you. You know what I mean? And I think Cal knows exactly what to say and what not to say. Service got ran quick, and I think the ump knew like service was protecting his guy, so he's like, "Yeah, we'll just toss you instead." Yeah, yeah. But yeah, somebody's getting tossed there. It's kind of a big ejection because you know Cal did. Well, yeah, because I mean, I, I honest, I mean, I thought, I think like a lot of people. I mean, I thought, bo- I thought both got ejected. Yeah, so did I. So like, I, like right away, I'm like, oh, well, that that sucks for the both are going to. I mean, it, it sucks more that, you know, that cow got tossed. But I, I thought for sure that he got run uh, for sure. And then they clarified it, you know, yeah. shortly thereafter. And, and thank God they thank God he didn't yeah. get run. Be just Jesus. They would have lost the game. Yeah. They would have lost both games in this series without without Cal Raleigh. 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Cal drove, drove in, what, three yesterday? Yeah. And uh, I was looking, I was, because I was not really, pre- I don't really prepare for this podcast. You know, we, we just go off the cuff <laughs> a little bit here. You know, we don't, uh, but. Most people just, that are listening and watching, they understand that. They, yes, they get that. They know. The, the regulars know. I was yeah. looking at the late and close stats uh, for the Mariners. Oh, this um, is a big topic. Yeah. And Cal Raleigh in 48 plate appearances and late and close is like seventh inning or later of a game. It's like you're tied, you're up one or you're down one. And like kind of how the, the go ahead run could be, I think it's the tying run can come to the plates somewhat. He's got 48 plate appearances in uh, these late and close situations. He has 11 hits, which include three doubles, seven homers. He's got 18 RBIs, eight walks and 13 strikeouts. His OPS in these in these situations, 1.046. That's pretty legit. You know who else is really good in late and close? He doesn't have as many at bats. But uh, 27 plate appearances. Josh Rojas has a sla- – or uh, Luke Rayleigh has a slash line of 478, 556, 652. And then Josh Rojas, uh, 440, 533, 640 slash line. So I don't know what they do in these late innings, but these guys are hitting. How about that bunt though? That how about oh. the bunt that Rayleigh got down? I mean, that's incredible on so many fronts. One, one that he did it with two outs. Two that he did it on a on a fastball that was a high and inside on him, and he was still able to get it down. Yeah, like we asked service about it. I'll probably try and write something on it. But part of it is he's just not afraid to stick his face out there. He's not afraid of the ball. Like, you know, he's he he has that kind of um, happy Gilmore mentality. You know, when Happy Gilmore gets into the the batting cage and says, oh, wait, 364 days till hockey tryouts and just wears it off his chest. That's kind of what Luke Rayleigh is. Like, if they throw it inside, he's going to let it hit him. And if he's going to bun it, you know, he's going to stick his face out there and not not be afraid of it. And I think that's it's pretty cool. You know, I know a lot of people like uh, – some people are like, oh, yeah, well, Luke Rayleigh bunted. See, you're wrong. I, go, I hate sack bunts. I never said I hated bunting for hits. You know, it was like Smokey McPot. I said, man, this is really does kill your short term memory, doesn't it? You know, I told him I felt I like Jesse, but it was like, I, I don't care. I, I hate sack bunting and I hate, I, gotcha. I don't even hate sack bunting if it's the right person. But the principle of playing small ball is stupid. Just automatically bunting. No, it's the right people in the right situations. You admit, but oh, OK, now time out. But you admit that there's a time and place for it. Yes, okay. there is. Every once in a while, it should be doing it. Like, like if you're late, if you're at home and there's a runner on second with nobody out, you can bunt them over, especially if you don't trust the guy to pull the ball to the right side to get him over, then yeah, bunt them over. It's a, it, what's crazy is, is how bad people are at bunting. Luke Rayleigh practices it. I think, I don't know. I was going to ask him how he practices it. Cause like going out and bunting off of, you know, service or, Tommy Joseph throwing BP. That's not really practicing it, but they do probably, I'm sure I've seen him. They put the velocity machine out there and crank that thing up to 90 and he's out practicing it, you know, and um, it, maybe it, he does it's it a off great the art form to too. it, man. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, there, there's a, there's a great art, there's a great art form to it. And I, and I think guys, and especially left-handers, it always just seems like left-handers have such an advantage to it. Anyways, it just, it, it just, it just feels easier for them. And especially being able to, you know, push it down the third baseline. Well, and, and he's got speed too. I mean, that doesn't work if he gets thrown out. You know, if, right. if you're slow and you do it, that it doesn't matter. But if you're you're fast and you know you can beat it out, because in that situation it's two outs. I remember when Ichiro used to bunt with two outs and it would drive Mark Har- Mike Hargrove crazy. <laughs> you know, two out bunt with a runner on second drive Mike Hargrove yeah. crazy. Oh, I bet it would. Okay, you know, we, let's. I mean, let's not bury the lead here. All right, we're almost nine minutes into this. Uh, all brought to you by Chalet Bull. Big thanks to Chalet Bull for being your Ryan Divish every single week here. PuckSports.com. What is the status of Brian Wu? Uh, I think he underwent an MRI yesterday. We haven't gotten the results. My guess is Scott Service will provide us an update, or maybe Justin Hollander will provide us an update. They're in. They're doing their draft meetings right now, so they have all their area scouts in, and they're doing a lot of draft meetings. So it's one of the reasons why we didn't talk to Hollander yesterday, or maybe because, you know, or on Monday, I guess, not yesterday, on Monday, because they're in draft meetings. But I think with this situation, they'll probably come out and discuss it. Uh, The discomfort was in his forearm area, not the, you know, and I guess that could leak into the elbow. Um, 
you know, it's, you kind of just wonder when this was going to happen. I mean, they'd already, they've talked about, I mean, I guess there's a reason why they weren't pushing him people. You know, they knew that like it wasn't bouncing back all the time. He'd already not been able to throw a bullpen in between starts once, maybe twice. And this week he couldn't do it again. He felt soreness. And so I think the wisely they skipped a start, shut him down and they figure it out. You know, they can retro the DL, the IL stint three days. And maybe that's what they need to do to let it calm down and trust that Emerson Hancock and Jonathan Diaz can handle it in some form or the other. Um and and maybe you know you're looking to see if there's any structural anything structural in there uh and and see what's causing the problem maybe there's some inflammation that's just getting uh aggravated every time so you know i i think we'll find out today or at worst tomorrow you know the the big thing will be is like if you see brian Wu's not there today when we go in and you know he's going to get a second opinion on something mm. that's when you really start to worry yeah, but the, what, 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 what should make everyone worry, though, though, right, it, Div, is that this is something that he's been dealing with for a long time. I mean, when I say dealing with for a long time, he had he had Tommy John surgery when he was at Cal Poly. He dealt he had an IL stint with this uh, same type of inflammation a year ago. He missed the start of the season because of this same problem. And now it's it's now it's popped up again. It, it yeah. almost it just feels like when he, we, we used to discuss this with Brash, right? Mm-hmm. It almost just feels inevitable that something w- was going to happen down the line. And I agree with you. I never was jumping on them about pitching them too much. Uh, I understood it. You get tantalized that you want to see him throw more, right? Mm-hmm. Because how good he is. But there, you you could understand what they were trying to do. And and I don't know, man. It just doesn't seem there, to, there seems to be any rhyme or reason on how you massage these guys. Do, no. do you do you, do you pitch them less? Do you pitch them more to build up arm strength? I, I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I I mean I hope let's bring it back to Wu here for a second. I hope it's good news on him. Yeah, but, um, we're hoping there's nothing structural, or, you know, and, and maybe it's just the way his arm slot is and the way his arm works that it's putting pressure on that on that forearm and elbow area. You know, it's hard to say. Um, and like I, they have been careful. It's not like he's going out there and and like throwing a hundred hundred pitches in an outing and doing all this other stuff. Hell, he's basically just throwing all fastballs. And like you look at how smooth his delivery is, and you know it's not for lack of leg strength that he's not being able to you know hurt his arm and the way he pitches. So it's just you know everybody's body is built different like you look at how logan gilbert pitches and it's like this giant flamingo out there firing strikes but <laughs> it seems to work and he seems to be able to post and so i think like look you're at a point in the season one you feel like you should beat the white Sox if you have to do a spot starter anyways and they did it wasn't pretty but you know if you can get it calmed down and you think look if we set him down for another three weeks three or four weeks and maybe this just gets rid of everything in there and then you have him again you you want him for august and september right you know they, these games all count the same but like not like the idea of not having him again for the rest of the season is bad like that's that's what you're worried about is like something happens something structural is wrong and they have to shut him down for the rest of the season or it requires another surgery what you're hoping is it's just inflammation it'll calm it down you know, and then I think in this situation, if they do put him back on, they're going to be very careful when they bring him back. It's going to be very controlled. Now, I'm sure you're about to ask me whether or not they should move him to the bullpen. Because, no, like, I'm not going to ask you if he's gonna, they should move him to the bullpen. Or six man ass. rotation. Are you going to go six Don't. man rotation? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Okay. This is what I'm going to ask you, you dick. This is what I was going to ask you. And I want you to do some work. I'm going to give you a story idea. Okay, I want it. I want an old school, you know, Corey Brock athletic deep dive. Oh yeah. I, I want to know what's causing this. I I, I want to know the rhyme or reason to these injuries, and I want to know what baseball people think. And I because they all and there's going to be a bunch of different opinions on this yeah. one. But I I just want to know. I mean, it felt like when we were growing up that, and again, maybe I'm wrong, and I probably am. It didn't seem to be this 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 massive amount of injuries to arms. And these guys threw a lot, like a lot more than these guys do. And but but they're not as physically fit. They don't have the diet. They don't have all the the exercise regimen. They don't have all the analytics. None of that stuff. 
I just want to know what what is the is the idea to throw more to build up arm strength? Is it to throw less to protect these guys because they are protecting them, but they're it just seems like there's this rapid rate of injuries with these guys. I, I just would like what's the what do baseball people think is the answer? I don't think there is one. That's the problem. It's like if there was one, they'd be doing it. And it's so different. It's body, sh- it's body type, throwing motion, everything. Like, you know, and and some of it seems to be controlled. Like Robbie Ray never had an elbow injury all through his career, and then he started throwing the split, and he started trying to ramp it up early and throw hard in the off season to get his velocity back. Blew out, you know, I, and, and he's older as well. So I, I don't know, like. Brian Wu didn't throw a lot when he was younger. He was a position player largely. You know, he was only a part-time pitcher. He wasn't one of those pitcher onlys that's going out and throwing in showcases and and pitching. You know, getting to 110 in in a in a select league game when he's younger. He didn't have the mileage on his arm, and he blew out in college. I think sometimes some people's bodies are just predisposed to certain injuries. For mine, it just feels like any kind of injury possible. It feels predisposed to you know, but like. With Wu, maybe it's something in his delivery. Like you you talk about the low arm slot. Maybe that's something. Does the elbow lead first with the lower arm slot? And that kind of how he delivers. Because, like, you look at it and the rhythm and the pace of the delivery and and how simple it is. You think, man, that's how you want to teach a kid to throw. But maybe that's not how. Because, like, you look at how Matt Brash threw. Or if you remember Carson Smith back in the day, you're like, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. No, I mean, right when I saw Matt Brash for the first time, I'm like, well, th- this will be fun for a year or two. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, I think that's. Well, it's really that's it's the, really windy out there in Ording today, isn't it? Yeah. It's starting to swirl. You got a twister behind you. Oh, a yeah. listener, a viewer, you you know where he's at. Listener on the podcast, Divish outside in his beautiful farmhouse uh, in Ording, Washington. Uh, he doesn't have the backdrop of uh, Rainier today, but uh, the wind well, is I'm, swirling. I moved it because so I, it I thought it was going to shade it from the wind. Maybe I can move my computer. No, you're good. Put you're the good. mic this way. Um, you're good. I'm sorry. You know, but that's the, you know, if, like I tell kids or like they want to say, oh, I like your job. No, you want to make money. So like study <laughs> biomechanics or like body movement, kinesiology. That's the next frontier in baseball is understanding how mechanically you can be efficient and also stay healthy. I mean, like, you know how much money teams invest in these people to try and figure out like how to keep these guys healthy. You know, like you saw with driveline just hooked up with a pitching company to add to their, like um, their staff because like, this is like injury prevention more than anything might be the biggest key to success versus like, maximizing performance like oh yeah trying to teach all these guys to throw hard or you know hit the ball hard or whatever like just keeping them on the field might be the biggest the biggest goal or the biggest like um aspect you can have for success like, look at look at that's what's made this mariners rotation really good is that the other the first four guys have not missed the start right you know i mean george had the sore knee the one time but you know, the, the, these guys post and not everybody does that, you know, and that's that's the difference. Yeah, it's just uh, I, I hope he's OK. You think we'll have probably a, a I, you would assume a word later today when you when you're at the ballpark with three, three o'clock ish as we yeah, record this around 10, little, 1030. Yeah, it's a little later today for service. I think he's going at four. Okay. Part of the injury prevention and stuff is they um, they don't do the on field stuff one day out of the home st- or a series just to kind of like guys hands get beat up, you know, the extra work. I think they'll probably do their defensive work, but they don't always hit on the field every, like they take a break from hitting on the field. They still do all their cage work and everything, but you know, some of these guys are probably taking 300 swings a day before the game even starts. They don't want that or 200 swings before. So like they, they try and dial it back to keep guys healthy. So on a, again, that's like the big thing, you know, I mean, that's what they hired, uh, Lorena Martin for, and now they have Rob Scheidegger and all these guys and they hire physical therapists and, and all these different people with fancy degrees about, you know, body composition, body movement, health, everything else, like the studies that they're doing on it, you know, I mean, Jeff Passon wrote a whole book on it and I don't think, you know, and he spent years doing the research and I don't think he came away with any one thing that said, Hey, here's how we fix it. (laughs) You know, I love Jeff. He's a good friend of mine, but like, yeah. 
there is no way because if there, there was i mean you'd be a billionaire if you figured it out it's crazy man it's just it's it's wild because yeah you're right i, I don't think there there is a uh, there's a solution i don't know i don't know what it is but it just no, it just seems a, like... a rash of these injuries and, and you've got the old school types i'll talk to kruger on monday and kruger will have an opinion about how like well because they don't throw enough or they don't you know they, well i don't know if that if, is that the solution throw more no i think honestly it's a product of throwing harder harder you're you're talking about maximum velocity and arm speed and everything else so your 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 tendons or your ligaments and stuff aren't aren't set up to handle the torque with which you're putting on them it's an unnatural movement anyways right so it's like you're throwing harder you're doing maximum effort and like whose delivery isn't maximum effort but again it's like you're throwing harder arm speed and whatever some people used to talk about how Strasburg threw like that they saw the arm issues with Steven Strasburg coming because of the the reverse M or whatever they call it you know the the reverse W of how he held the ball and how his arm and came through but it, you know I just think it's like you can only throw so much for so long and it especially when you throw that hard it's different than if you're like Maddox or or Jamie Moyer or even Glavin, you're not putting maximum torque. On yeah, I wonder though. I wonder. I wonder if it's this. I, I wonder if it's it's a product of of these guys because now this generation of ball player has been is probably in that that select club baseball world now. Before mm -hmm. like those guys were before maybe, maybe that has something to do with this. I I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think out loud because there was a. Um, you know, there was a, a a tweet that came out. I think this week is it CJ Nowitzki? Nowitzki? Yeah. Nowitzki. Yeah, he's a analyst for the uh, no CJ Nikowski. Nikowski, he's an I'm analyst sorry. for the Braves. For the Braves. Um, yeah, he used to be with the Rangers. Nice guy. Yeah, I, I I know him a little bit. He posted. I don't know if you saw this. He posted that that some somebody had sent them this pitching line from a 13U baseball game. So 13 years old, and the line was. This kid, uh, David, threw three and two third innings. He gave up thirteen runs. He threw a hundred and seventeen pitches. Yeah, I mean <laughs> negligence. Yeah, I mean, but how much? I mean, think about it. how much does that happen? Probably a lot. I mean, like I know Adam Jude was upset for his son throwing like ninety five pitches in his first outing of the spring. You know, and and he didn't really know. You know, you don't want to be that coach that it costs the or that dad that it costs the coach, but like, Hey man, that's what we're doing here. Um, yeah. I, I think the throwing aspect and all, but like, like we said with Wu, he wasn't a pitcher really like a full-time pitcher coming up. He, he played out or shortstop. I believe he was an infielder. Plus he pitched a little bit, um, you know, and, and I, it's like, how do you do it? Like Logan Gilbert does all this stuff in between outings. You know, he has all the different things to try and keep himself healthy. It's not just about like performance, but it's about health. You know, I, I got on one of the kids on, on, uh, my girlfriend's son's team. He threw, you know, he, he threw 105 pitches. He's built up. He threw 105 pitches, the limit in Legion threw a one hitter struck out 15. It was brilliant. But you know what? After you do that, you need to go run. You need to run the next day. You need to do arm care. You need to ice. You need to do all that stuff. Yeah. And he didn't do it. And then he's like, well, I'm sore. Well, that's your fault. You didn't go run. You know what you need to do. You got to go do that. So I think a lot of it too is the arm care after you do all this. I mean, like, look, I'm stupid too. I, when I was playing men's fast pitch, I threw 36 innings in one day. <laughs> like, you know, and then trying to drive home and God forbid, like, you, you know, you do, so you can't even, you know, it's just like, you can't move. And it's like, people don't, people, like, at least Wu told them, like, he wasn't feeling right. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, I can't do this. This isn't right. And that's maybe going to save them. But I just think they're going to have to relook at everything from a biomechanical standpoint and everything within that arm and say, okay, here's what's causing pressure. You know, it's like Emerson Hancock with the lat injury he had three times he went on with lat strains they went through and they changed up what he did in between outings to help keep him healthy you know because he was throwing too much he was throwing too hard too often in between like that's i think with Wu and these younger pitchers you have to figure out a way to like to recover 
and to allow yourself to recover. And the Mariners are in a tough stretch where they don't, you know, they didn't have a ton of off days and get guys rest. So maybe that's something they have to address. But I don't think moving him to the bullpen is an easy solution. I don't think a six-man rotation is an easy solution when he comes back. They may do it for a couple of weeks, but, you know, if you're trying to win a division and you don't just want to win a division, you want to get a better record than the Guardians or the Yankees so you can get the first round by. So I, I don't know. It's like I don't know where they're at with him. And I, I we've asked. I mean, Adam's been talking to people about it. I, I'm just going to blame Matt Calkins. He wrote that column on how good Brian Wu is, and he went down the next day. So let's blame Calkins. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. You know, let's – Calkins is an easy target, and I think really an appropriate target. Yeah, he's a ginger, and he's yeah, and, ball, yeah, and it's easy to blame the gingers for things like this, is yeah. it not? Yeah, I mean, they, they have should no really soul. go after them. They have no soul, you know. That's what they say. They about. they really don't. They yeah. really don't have a, a soul. I. What about the the other pitcher? Where, where are we at with Andres Munoz? Um, I think they're just trying to maintenance it a little bit, you know. And trying to just let it calm down. And if they can find ways to avoid using him for a few days, they're going to do it. Uh, he didn't feel like – he said he didn't hurt after his outing in Kansas City. He just said it felt weird on the mound, mostly because he hadn't thrown in a while. But I think, you know, I'm sure he'll probably be available today. But if you can give him a couple of days for a little while just to see if it calms down, my guess is like, you know, maybe there's a disc that's a little out of place or maybe there's just something that's, you know, a strain that just isn't – allowing yourself to get healed up because you don't rest it completely, you know, getting on a, you know, getting on a flight after you throw an inning doesn't help any either. So like they're doing all the treatment he's got the constant um, coverage on his back and everything. But like, I just think that unless they gave him a month down, it's not going to get better. Hey, this is one of the first times that you and I have done this, that we've had, you know, some breaking news while we're recording this. I mean, eventually we will. We're, you and I are going to go live, and so this will be this will be better. Uh, do, have you seen the Mariners move this? Not, and it's not in regards to Wu or anything, but uh, John, yeah, Jonathan Diaz, yeah, Diaz has has gone down, yeah. uh, and then Brett DeGuys is it DeGuys? Yeah, DeGuys. Yeah, he has been recalled from Tacoma. Yeah, I so. mean, like maybe they believe that that um, that. We'll be able to make his next start in a few days, and then they got the reliever for a couple extra days. It's an extra arm, um, or you know, or they if they are going to slot Hancock in because that's why they didn't bring him up this time is because he hadn't the way the rest was he would have been on short rest. Right. So if they're going to re-slot with um, the off day and everything else, they they have it's just a, it's roster you know it's kind of rosterbation. Bring up some guys and move them around. Because you can't. That's a that's a good term. Roster. What did you say again? Rosterbation. (laughs) I usually do that about people. They get uh, 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 like sit there and like get all upset about the roster and stuff like that. Him and a ha over who's going to make it and who isn't. Yeah. So So I want to go back to Munoz here real quickly before I want I want to pivot back to to Cal and, and Julio in a sec, but. So for Munoz, how do you th- going forward? What do you think the plan is and in, in how they want to use him? Um, I think for the time being, they're just going to be careful. I'll probably try and give him a day off after he, he throws, which is tough when he's your best reliever by far. Right. Um, but I think you know they're going to be ultra careful, and I think if they get you know if they get to a point, maybe it's when Santos comes back um, as healthy, or maybe if Logan Evans is ready to go that you know that you can bring in another power i'm obviously not going to make logan evans your close or anything but if there there gets to be a stretch where they have some some better depth then maybe they they put them on the 10 or the 15 day aisle and say hey look two weeks you're going to get this back healthy you're going to come back and ready to go because he's pitched through it and i just think the strain and the the little mini collision was what made it worse like he'd been pitching through it all year and you know, it's just, I think a lot of times it's not so much the day you go to throw, it's the day after you throw that's an issue. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. We, we talked about Cal in the beginning about his, and you, you brought up the clutch stats, right? And you brought up his, mm-hmm. his late, his late and close stats, uh, which were again, 275 this year. He slugged 650. He's OPS over a thousand, four home runs. He's driven at 18. He's got uh, three doubles. I think I mentioned the four home runs. Okay. So, 
I, I made this comment the other day, and God, there's just you know, there's this Julio Rodriguez fan club. In my perception of Julio, when ga- when the game is on the line, in the big big moments, to me, he feels like I don't want to say he fails because fails that he doesn't come through in the moments like Cal does. He hasn't mm-hmm. had a real he really. He's only had what one game winning hit, I believe, in his career. Well, well, like technically, if if both doesn't give up the the bomb the other day, that's a game winning hit against the Royals. That's right. Yeah, you're right. You're and right. then, like you know, if I mean against in the Cal Grand Slam game, he legitimately hit the ball too hard to score the winning run. <laughs> he hits that nuke to left field, and JP can't score on it because he yeah he uh yeah you know, he can't score. Oh, you know. Okay, so his his late close stats are four twenty four slugs five fifteen, but he only just has the one extra base hit. So there, I mean, he's he has a lot of singles, and f- singles are fine. But you are expecting more from him than just than just singles. Th- but there is, so my perception of him is that he doesn't come through in the clutch. The numbers would suggest, well, you're an idiot and you're wrong. Uh, which and not suggest. I mean, they they show that. But yeah, he's hitting four twenty four in late and close. Yeah, four twenty four with a four seventy two yep. on base, five fifteen slug. You know, I mean, like. It's, you know, he has 14 hits and 33 played or 33 at bats. And if, you know, he has less strikeouts, he has 10 strikeouts and 36 plate appearances. That's a little bit under what he's, you know, it's about, tw- about his normal strikeout percentage. But it's, you don't remember the good. You remember the failures. Yeah. You remember uh, the good. And, so, it's, and it's easy because you hold him to such a high standard. Is that, is that, so that's what I, my conclusion was is that we hold him to this incredible standard. And we expect him at every moment to, to come through in those situations. And I think what led what led to the frustration was the other day. It was the, before the Cal hit the the walk off Grand Slam was the eighth inning. Here's a golden opportunity for Julio. He's your superstar player. You need to get him going. He you know he's he struggled this year, and he's got the bases loaded against a terrible team, and he strikes out. Yeah, I mean he doesn't have the slug per se. Like he has the one homer and no doubles. You know, he has 14 hits and 36 plate appearances. That's more than anybody else in those late and close. Some of them are infield hits, but like he's not making outs either. So I think part of it is, and, and service talked about that. It's just like understanding, you know, it's t- Cal admitted it took him some time to kind of understand his approach in these games. And he's, he said, he goes, I failed more than you think. Um, but part of this, I think Cal hits breaking balls better than Julio does. Okay. And I think that's part of it too. But Cal's able to kind of hit those breaking balls that are kind of low and going towards his back yeah. foot. Julio doesn't get those. He gets the ones running away from him, but he doesn't hit them real well. So, And that's and you're not going to get fastballs all okay. the time. So it's like, how do you how do you do it? You know, and I think that's that comes with experience more than anything and like being able to slow it down. Cal's 25. Is he 25? Julio's 22. That's three years. I mean, Cal played three years of high level college baseball. He played, you know, he's has. So more what big you're big saying is, is, hey, 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 Tubbo, get off his goddamn back and stop criticizing him. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. I mean, like, I, I, there's a lot of criticism of Julio for a lot of things. Like, I get people who say he shouldn't be nice to their team. He shouldn't interact with other players. I don't, I don't mind that. So I know, but that's because, like, hey, Hardo, you know, like, not everybody has freaking, you know, the, you don't have Billy Martin as your manager where they want you to play like a robot, like. Be totally hypocritical if Scott Service told Julio, "Hey, don't smile and interact with players." After you tell him, like, be yourself. You know, like, at the end of the day, does he play hard? Does he prepare? Yeah. Exactly right. That's all you matter. Like his 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 interaction with the opposition doesn't doesn't prevent him from playing hard. He plays hard on every single play. Every single play he plays hard. Him and Luke Rayleigh just, I mean, bust ass on everything, everything. Yeah. Um, so, all right. I mean, I just you know. I, I think it's it's not a it's it's not so much a criticism. It's just like I think with the and maybe the price tag thing is unfair, but it's it's not even that. It's just you know how good he is. He is he can yeah. be a generational talent, and I think it's just in those moments it just kind of was highlighted because of how frustrating that game had gone. That you've got your best player up there with with the bases loaded, and you want him to you know shoot smack a bases clearing double in the gap or a grand slam like. Like Raleigh did. See, but to me, like I, if I'm the Mariners, and like Julio takes this his failures 
harder than fans do. Yeah, right. He has a, his his expectations for himself are like be one of the greatest in the game. Sure. Not just be good. To me, what you're looking for from Julio in those situations is hit the ball hard and have a good approach. Don't strike right. out. You know? Well, because you're not going to double him up. So, like, hit the ball hard and, like, have a good approach. Don't be afraid. Don't try and hit the homer. Just try and hit the ball hard. Get it. Like, a lot of times it's just get the ball in the outfield. Don't hit it on the ground. So, like, in Kansas City the other day, when shit's gone wrong completely and they get up there and they have – he's up and – he gets the fastball away and just punches it to right and hits the single. You know what? That's just as effective. It scores the go ahead run. And what it did do too, is it allowed, it kept the inning going. So Cal could get the insurance hit. Like, like I think, you know, the other day he hits the ball hard in that situation. It just happens to one bounce to the left fielder. They can't score on it. Like he did everything right. You know, I think we hold him to such a high standard right. that if it's not, the highlight moment you know like look at yesterday he steals a bag and is able to score on the double because he steals the bag scores from first on the play on cal's double which proves to be you know yeah the go ahead they got can he get more i i that was i thought one of the biggest signs yesterday were the two steals yeah need to see maybe he should slide a little sooner well he's terrible at sliding well, I think he doesn't realize how fast he's going sometimes. But he is like, – I'd like to see him like steal physic, more bags. Yeah, the physics of him, like sometimes, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's not a – spent a lot of time worrying about physics and how he moves, but he's moving so fast and he's so big, he needs to slide further away. Because right. he just – he's got so much – You and I would you know, slide right when we got on the bag. I'm not sliding. <laughs> it's like – it's like when I, I I got conned into playing a lob softball game and guys are wearing pants and sliding. I'm like, I am on your team. I didn't sign up for this. Where's the beer? Where's the and beer? Try, I got a I got a I'm wife beater on and I'm I'm yeah. drinking beer and smashing I, balls to right field. I I told them there's a pretty good chance that if we hit the home run limit, I'll probably get an out from hitting a home run because that's all I'm trying to do every time. <laughs> I'm in that's what I like. There he is, Ryan Devish. Uh, his weekly uh, appearance, bi-weekly appearance, brought to you by uh, Chalet Bowl. He'll be back with us on uh, Friday, but episode 154 in the books. Big thanks to Reggie, uh, Reggie Frederick and his uh, family. ChaletBowl.com uh, is the website. Make your next reservation. Uh, bowling Alley Station, 1941, located in Tacoma's Proctor District. You're the best. Have a wonderful Wednesday. We'll see you on Friday. Hey, you need to bring your kid to the Buner buzz cut and cut that mop off. No, 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 no. Just no, go cut no. it off. Cut a mullet into it. Well, he had a mullet, that. and then he got rid of the mullet. I want the mullet to come back, but now he's he's trying to grow it back out again. A little floppy surfer thinking? hair. When is the Buner buzz night? Thursday. Third. Yeah, no, I don't want a buzz. No. A mullet, yes. Mohawk? Yeah, but it's too – it's like – it's it's the mohawk wouldn't look good. The the sure. mullet though, I want the mullet to come back, so maybe I'll convince him to do it. I like if he as long as he gets the lightning bolts on well, the he, side. Well, he used to put his number in the side and that was great. But the lightning oh, bolt is a good one too. Yeah. I, I, I never had hair that could grow a mullet. I had the Fred Savage and yeah. the Wonder Years hair just to help. Yeah, me. sure. All right. You're the best. We'll talk to you Friday. All right. See you, man.